first thing before any any uh, action really, or certainly before any uh, discussion such as this, it's a very good idea to come to collect ourselves, to come into the present moment. Those of you that have been watching videos might already have picked up, picked up my favourite phrase, feet on the ground, which is really a very helpful way a first step towards bringing us into the present moment. Even if your feet aren't on the ground, just try and wiggle your toes, just so you're aware of your feet, wherever they are. If your feet are on the ground, you feel the steadiness of the earth, of the ground. You know, the ground is still, isn't it? Our minds are commonly racing about here, there and everywhere. But the dear earth is still, is at peace. Is constant. And then if we just listen, oh nice, you can hear the distant sheep, can't you? And you can listen into the endlessness of the silence beyond the sounds. It's so simple, isn't it? Even if someone's talking, you can listen beyond the talking into the silence beyond. And similarly, if we look, our attention is held by whatever it is we're looking at. And so, bless my soul, we find ourselves that our mind is at rest, isn't it? If we're attentive to what we're looking at and listening to, there's no more attention left for thinking, is there? Now, if you only listen with half your attention, the other half, of course, can be happily thinking. That's why we need to listen with full attention. Really listen, really look, and your mind will come to rest. There you are. Meditation. As simple as that. End of problem. No more questions. No more doubt. past, no more future, just now, here and now. I'm a lucky one now because I'm looking out the window, you see, and I can see trees and the horizon and the sky beyond. And as I came out of the, um, where we had breakfast, 
and started walking up the path. Of course, I saw that uh, outline of those rocks in front of me, the skyline. I thought of those words from the Psalms. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. How true, from whence cometh my help. You see, just when we lift up our mind to whatever's, I can just see the trees outside just moving in the breeze, and immediately one has a connection with its help, isn't it? It's like, an in, like you're held by an invisible hand. So I can't recommend too much for you, just to, even if you live in a city, whenever you feel lost, just longing for some sort of, something to hold on to, just look at the sky, lift up your eyes. Even in a city these days, there's usually a tree somewhere, or a bit of grass. Never without help, really. I've just had a few conversations this morning, so already I, I've got a few questions that I'll try to just touch on, but... Uh, um, I know most of you actually are town dwellers, aren't you, from London? So it, it uh, um, Christian raised the question of connection with nature. It's worth recognizing that uh, Part of the symptom of not having really as much access to nature as perhaps we we might have, we, the human condition is unnatural, isn't it? Naturally. So hardly surprising, is it? We live in an unnatural world. So, uh, so we find ourselves in an unnatural state. Why is it that the trees seem to be perfectly content? They're not all worrying about the virus or the past or the future. They're just there gently responding to the movements of the wind. And here are we all sort of, you know, worrying in our heads. How helpful it can be just to look at a tree or look at the grass. I'm a great believer in grass. I love grass. Lovely just to rest in this stillness here. Now, if we're lucky enough to to feel fairly confident with this stillness, then it really is remarkable how questions we just dissolve away. Um, or if, if they exist at all, they exist somehow sort of floating around, somehow down there. And this absence of questions is predominant. But I speak now after a long life of practice in meditation when this seems simple to me. And of course, as a younger person, it wasn't like this at all. 
And like Kate, I was consumed by this thought of making the world a better place. And it was all very compulsive for me. Took me off to South America to do just that. You see, we can't grow up until we're ready. You can't hasten the seasons, can you? You can't hasten. We've got winter to face now, haven't we? We can't hasten spring. And similarly, we can't grow up. We can't just suddenly <laughs> you know, opt out of thinking how to make the world a better place just by thinking and by another thought it might be a good idea to do so. We can't be holier than we are. So these questions are a bit sort of theoretical, aren't they? You can't, dear. Yes, of course it's love. It's love at that level and at that point in your life. There may be... You see, there's a very helpful thing called levels of consciousness. Now just think, think of a worm working its way through the dark earth, just swallowing matter, a worm. And then think of something like a little beetle, that's just a little bit more mobile, isn't it? Coming up out of the earth and walking about on the surface. And then something else, a, a mole perhaps, a little bit more alive and warm-blooded. Then a different rabbit or something, a bit more alive. Birds, an eagle up there. Although we've got a levels of consciousness, haven't we? Or the stone, a more or less inert stone. And then the living soil full of little creatures and fertility. And then the plants, trees, animals. See, nature is full of levels of consciousness. And everything is, needs understanding in terms of levels of consciousness, you see. There is, uh, you know, the animals like the worms, the animals, and man. Then what about the fairies, and the angels, and the archangels, and the spirits? This hierarchy of heaven. Levels of consciousness. Freedom, think about freedom, what's freedom to a worm? Or freedom to a rabbit, or freedom to a bird in a cage. And so it is with us. You know, a lot of us, a lot of people don't know what, you know, we live in a little book somewhere, we live in a little flat somewhere. Maybe you don't want freedom. Some people are bursting for freedom. Some people think in terms of political freedom. Other people want even greater freedom, freedom of the spirit. Some people just can't bear to be fenced in. Other people love it, it makes them feel secure, safe. So these different levels. And so it is with love. You know, most of our early experiences of love, we want to hold something, don't we? We want to trap it get it for ourselves. For love it almost equates with wanting, doesn't it? Wanting for me. Is there something more than that? A greater love? At last, look at us in this room. What's this stillness? What's this presence? We look at each other, what, what flows? And yet does this want to possess? What does this want to grab? Capture? And 
doesn't it extend beyond this room into the outside through the trees the sky where does it end You see, love has many levels, and we can't grow up before we're ready for it. You may get a glimpse of this, because of course we come back to this again, don't we? We go up and down this, like a yo-yo, up and down all day long. One minute, down here, and next minute like that, up and down all the time. It's very confusing. If we try to capture these concepts, these questions, put them into a little box, you know, it doesn't fit, does it? And the bigger the question about love, the more impossible it really becomes to capture it within a concept. that question dear all your life long you'll get a different answer every day of your life you think I'm an old man I'm not I'm just a little child <laughs> little child in the nursery just like you we all are let's not fool ourselves it's extraordinary how the questions and answers and see it always pulls us away doesn't it we lose the presence even I do I'm constantly losing it so this is really what uh, I was taught when I was learning to meditate this was called the work which is to constantly keep coming back to being present to being attentive because it's like elastic, we just pulled away all day long, pulled away by what we're going to have for breakfast, you know, going to must, must say something, you know, make conversation or something to ease the atmosphere or something. You know, million and one reasons we're pulled away, and it's a very good habit to keep coming back. Immediately we're reconnected, and the more we do it, the more this habit establishes itself and becomes, first of all, second nature and then our first nature. But it takes many, many, many years, my dear, and I assure you, look how old I am, I'm still learning. I'm still practicing, still trying to, still doing it. And we keep on falling. Krishna was asking about different sorts of mantras. Do you all know what a mantra is? Well, I'm not going to ask you all what your mantra is because it doesn't really matter, but I'm sure you've all, if you've all got one or something, even if it's not a sound, you may have some sort of mental focus. Well, indeed, there are many of them, and uh, as long as you're happy with this, well, then that's all's well. I'm a bit reluctant to generalize too much. But generally, if you ask yourself what you really, really love, what you really, really want, which is perhaps the same thing. This is usually like a bit of an inner compass within ourselves, isn't it? That's pulling us towards it.
And this is really the motive of meditation. To follow that calling to what we love most. I suppose that's why, traditionally, long-established mantras have usually been the name of God. Because whatever we conceive God to be, it's that which calls us, that towards which one's heart is drawn. which gives meaning to the meaninglessness of life. Perhaps it might just be present here now. In this rest, Perhaps it seems rather far away now in a rather distant world of different names and forms and methods and this and that. It all rather merges, doesn't it, into one. Nameless and formless, but nonetheless the realest of the real. ever present here and now like invisible arms holding us come unto me beloved come home where you belong isn't that how it is and it's always So we study and work and search, read books, come on retreats and watch videos. Ah, thoughts. What is a thought? Well, dear, in con... Yeah, well, right, okay. Well, um, come, let's come to stillness. What we can say about thought is that it is a, a movement, isn't it? A, a, a movement in the mind. Just like I'm looking now and the, the trees are just moving in the breeze and the clouds are uh, moving across the sky. Thoughts, thoughts are movement. There are two aspects of creation, aren't there? One that doesn't change, which is this presence here and now, which is changeless. There's another aspect that is all change. So we have the eternal and the transient, coexistent, ever present, here and now. Interesting, isn't it, that part of us asks, what a thought? So what is it that asks the question? As though there's like a bird's eye view, isn't there? There's an observer who, who 
is aware that I'm thinking. Otherwise, how do you know you're thinking? I'm thinking and I don't like my thoughts, so I don't I wish I wasn't thinking. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Now, my dears, if ever if you ever buy any of my books, you'll find <laughs> one of the first poems I wrote many, many, many years ago it was about clouds. I think it's one of the best things I've ever written. Because if you look at the sky, there are clouds in it, aren't there? It's as natural as ABC, isn't it? Well, there's nothing wrong with clouds, is there? They, they form a, perform a natural function. They, where would we be without clouds? But when we get in an aeroplane, what happens? Where are the clouds? Yes, they're above us now, aren't they? And when you go in an aeroplane, they're below you. And then, what about them? We go on a miserable win win winter day when we're all under the weather. You go up there and the lovely blue sky, isn't there? And you look down. <laughs> You can hardly believe that, <laughs> that all your friends and companions are living there under this blanket of cloud. No wonder they're all so miserable. Hmm? Now then, this is exactly what meditation does, you see. It's just like a, an aeroplane. It takes you beyond the clouds. And then you look down on these clouds. Or thoughts, because clouds are just like thoughts, aren't they? They're a layer. It's a layer, that's all they are. A layer of consciousness. There's subconsciousness, there are no thoughts. When you're asleep, there are no thoughts, are there? You wake up into the dreaming state, yes, that's when they start. You 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 spend most of your day in the, in your head, trapped in thought. This is the human condition. I'll repeat that. The human condition is lost in thought. If you've got a problem, or anybody's got a problem, where is it? It's here, isn't it? It's in this layer of consciousness. You go up into the sky, there's no thought up there, is there? No clouds. So what happens to all our human problems? You can either be below them or above them. It's in this middle layer that the problem exists. You know, I've lost the question. What was the question? Oh, uh, what is the nature of thought? Yes, what is nature of thought? Well, here we are. It's just a layer, a layer, a layer of movement in consciousness. So, now many people try to get rid of thoughts. And, uh, oh yes, another question. How do I... Uh, you know, the ego, of course, a lot of people get the idea of trying to get rid of the ego. My God bless myself, how on earth do you get rid of the ego? My dear, if, if you got rid of the ego, none of us would be here, would we? <laughs> We'd be up there in the sun. We'd be up there in heaven. <laughs> we wouldn't exist. <laughs> the very fact that this is crystallized ego. That's why it dies. This is corrupt. This is the body of sin, for those of you that are into Christian language. And man is a sinner. In other words, he's absented himself from the presence of God, which is this stillness, which is spirit, and become this visible mortality, corrupt mortality, that rots away in the grave and is food for worms. That's what this body is. When you get to my age and you're lucky enough to, to see freedom ahead of you, <laughs> you begin to see it more clearly. When you're young and beautiful, it's more difficult. It seems more real. Now, you can't get rid of the ego at all. But what you can do, you can see it, you see. And we have to begin by realising what, what, that there is this 
there's this body of, whatever you call it, body of sin, I'll use the word, this mortality. And there is present here this, just feel it, this eternal presence, which is eternal life. which is in, which is not divided, it's not separate. How many stillnesses are there in this room? There's only one, isn't there? Nameless, formless, but reality itself. And then, as you come down through the clouds, through the mind, which, which First of all, gets the idea of separation, and which ends up, as it were, precipitating and eventually crystallizing into what we call separate you and me. For all the problems of separation. then the, the freedom comes from discrimination when you begin to recognize what man is and then you see what man is not that we are in we ourselves have have lost our divine inheritance if you like and that's why what we all long for in our hearts more than anything else is actually to restore ourselves to the wholeness, to our original wholeness, which is to come back to what we call God. Just like a flower grows towards the sun, you see, it's as natural as that. Meditation is simply a process of just turning in that direction. And when we turn, then naturally you just let go, don't you? You let go all these thoughts, these impediments. In this absence from the source of life, which is what we're talking about, this spirit, this invisible, indescribable presence, which is really the wholeness, the fullness of everything, like the air in balloons. Think what a balloon is without the air in it. It's nothing, is it? With the air, it becomes something, doesn't it? That's really what we're dealing with. Because we, you see, in our absence from this, in the Bible it uses the phrase, the wages of sin is death. So we, we absent ourselves, become identified with this. So this is condemned to die. And this is the, the justice. It's a just world, a totally just world. We bring the seeds of death. And we infect the whole world with death. That's why everything in the world dies. It's, our, it's like spreading this virus, five million times more, more dangerous than coronavirus. Is this, is, this, is this curse of sin? And as again the Bible says, cursed is the world for thy sake. And this is death. Man brought death into the world. And hence all this destruction is all my fault. Because I've absented myself, because I've forgotten where I belong. So yes, of course the world's condemned to death. Think 
thinking is like, yes, it is. It's just like mental digestion, you see. Just like we, we put different food in our mouth and let our tummies deal with it. Well, so we go around the world, we read the news and we talk to each other and all this sort of mental food goes into our brains and, our, and it has to be digested. So thinking really is quite accurately described as mental digestion. And if the stuff is uncomfortable, if you feed yourself on, you know, a world that's all that losing our biodiversity and it's all going to end in some terrible, we're all going to die with, with viruses or something, then that's what you'll be thinking about. And you'll get tummy ache, mental, mental ache, mind ache, un uncomfortable thinking then how do I get rid of my thinking? Oh dear, be more discriminating. That's the first step, isn't it? Look at clean and wholesome things rather than unclean and unwholesome things, as far as it's possible in this world. I recognise it's difficult because these things are floating around in the atmosphere. You can hardly avoid them. Well, all right, we all take on the, these these negative things. Well, you know, the, one of the first uh, Jesus's good advice to us is, "Judge not, judge not, that ye be not judged." It's a great thing if we can learn not to judge, not to criticize other people very difficult when we're young especially we all feel this you know so passionately about polar bears or everything rubbish but it's been the part of spiritual works from the beginning not try not to judge others why do we do the things we do? Aren't we all to blame? Each of us doesn't say things we wish we hadn't said or think unkind thoughts or do things we regret. So why should we judge others? Blame yourself, my dear. The first of sinners is me. hear your mouth saying unpleasant things if you can't stop it at the time at least try to notice it afterwards and try not to do it or try not to do it again the dreadful thing the tongue will run away with you and say all sorts of horrid things and this again is work spiritual work try to see it When we come into this stillness, you see, is there any judgment? Yes, isn't is there? It's just love, isn't it? It's just love, total, all-embracing love, warts and all. That's the love of God, you see, that embraces the whole world. It's such a marvellous exercise, this. It's utterly simple, you see. Just hold this question in stillness. And what's the answer? Yes, of course, it's all contained, isn't it? It's all contained in this universal oneness. And yet within this, we have death, corruption, diseases,
very often the answer to questions isn't really either or this or that. This is what we call duality. There's always a greater containment. You see, within that greater containment, again, the scripture says, with God, you see, in one, all things are possible. And as we go up and down in this yo-yo, you see, so it is that one moment the world is utterly simple and the next moment it's just nothing but problems. It's the same world, exactly the same world. All that's gone up and down is this level of consciousness. You know, that word understanding, how do I understand it? You know, think of that word as standing under. Interesting way of looking at it. How do we understand it? Is it above us? Are we standing under it? Or is it, are we above it? Hmm. Let's come back here, back to our reference point. How can it be that the world, such as Tracy describes, is held within the unfailing peace People talk a lot about justice, don't they? It's a very topical thing these days. We talk about trying to make a just world. The little children are asked what they want, and school children, and they, and they, and God bless them, and they write down a just world. It's almost as though we're taught that it's an unjust world. Is it? Let's consider how I can look at that. Watch, I'm watching these leaves just move before the wind. How is it that every leaf is just perfectly moving in accordance with the force of the wind? Every blade of grass is just perfectly responding to the forces of, we use clever words like gravity, don't we, or one thing or another, just forces of nature. How is it that all the vegetation is responding to autumn and the less light and it's gradually dying down now? It's all just happening, isn't it? The insects are finding their winter homes. Birds are beginning to migrate south. Leaves are turning. It all takes place within this changelessness, this eternal changelessness. of movement, the world of rest, the world of change, the world of no change. What is this injustice we talk about? No two grains of sand are, are the same, are they? No two blades of grass are the same, are they? Are any two hairs of our head the same? What are we talking about? A few days ago I watched this latest David Attenborough film, they called it um, 
I forget what's the name. What's it called? Extinction. Extinction, is it? Yes. And the latest sort of word is biodiversity, isn't it? And um, I see there's, there's some scientists now who are saying that this virus, you see, is a product of the decline in biodiversity and the balance of, of these bugs is, is upset, so you get imbalances arise. But of course, who's to blame? Me, isn't it? My fault. The buck stops here, doesn't it? Not your fault, it's mine. I'm the first one to absent, because when I'm present, you see, I don't see that fault in you. It's only when I'm at fault that I see that you're at fault. The pure in heart see God. When I was a young man of 26 years old, I was consumed by this idea to go to make the world a better place. I went to South America to do it, much to my parents' despair. I went. And after I'd been there a year, tried to do just that, not very well. I was sitting on a mountain on the Andes once. And I seemed to hear a little voice saying to make whole, be whole. I describe this in my books. Oh, somebody's got it on their T-shirt, haven't they? That's right. Oh, yeah. oh it's more, yes, yes, that's right. Yes, yes, look at you. And a picture of John. <laughs> there, my friends, that was given to me as a young man of 26 sitting on top of the Andes when I think probably it's one of my first moments of being humbled in my life. <laughs> when instead of thinking that I could sort out South America, <laughs> um, I, uh, I realised I wasn't doing such a good job. And this little voice said to make whole be whole. And of course, I didn't really understand it then at the time. I've been trying to understand it all my life. I'm still, But it's something to do with that, isn't it? And when we ourselves find that, that perfect justice, that perfect, find the meaning of why God is described as most merciful Father. Do you know how the old prayer books uses the phrase, almighty and most merciful God? How can it be that most merciful God apparently ordains all these things in the world? When you draw back and you get a higher point of view, you begin to understand it. And you begin to understand that it's my fault. I've absented myself. I am out there in the world spreading criticism and judgment that I know better. The world shouldn't be like this. And it's all the fault of the president or something, or the polit politicians, or the economy, or the business, or the latest you know, something or other, always blaming other people, always judging, thinking we know better. And if we come back to this presence and that angry, critical ego sort of settles down. You see that? And if the grass does if the grass and the leaves move in perfection. And everything contained. If you can't understand it intellectually, we can't be honest. Waste of time trying. You can't condense the great into the small. We're always trying to do this. We're always trying to bring God into our own human concepts and end up making a fool of ourselves. End up just arguing about it. Is that? Who's right, who's wrong? What 
what you think about it. That's why when anybody asks me a question, what do you think, I won't I tell you, because I don't trust my thoughts, I don't trust anybody else's. I advise you to do the same. What do I think about it? Mm. Come back to being present. There are levels of knowledge too, just like levels of love, levels of consciousness. See, at one level of knowledge, we, it's like, uh, you know, school knowledge, encyclopedic knowledge, facts. We see always divisive, aren't they? This or that, hot or cold, black and white, right or wrong. Then just. Come more into the present, find this oneness. You begin to see things more as a whole. You see this childish knowledge, and you become more mature, you grow up. You begin to speak almost another language, don't you? You look at a child, you say, oh, you, you'll grow up out of it. You'll understand when you get older, we say to young people. And beyond that sort of knowledge, knowledge goes on and on. Higher knowledge, higher consciousness. And then you come to knowledge that is beyond the facts. Faith, which is really higher knowledge. Knowledge of the invisible. How do you know that this stillness exists? You can't describe it. How do we know that we're sitting here in peace? How do we know that we love each other? I look at your shoes, it's contained in love, aren't they? bits of paper, your bio, your flask. It's all perfect, isn't it? Perfectly ordained. Totally lovable. All differences are contained, contained, aren't they? There isn't really any difference, because it's all one. Come down, lose that sense of oneness. Come on, get down here. Oh, it's all, it's all wrong. It's untidy, isn't it? The shoes shouldn't be like that. Who wants to take off their smelly shoes and leave them in a room? It's not bad, not nice, is it? You know, this is a totally different level of thinking, isn't it? Level of perception. So you see, dear, does that answer your question, <laughs> sort of? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Somewhat. Somewhat. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? The world makes such a, an issue of all our different sort of social, sexual, everything sort of differences these days. And yet, in this blessed oneness, you see, what's it all add up to? It all becomes somewhat meaningless, doesn't it? Of course, down here it's very meaningful, and that's, this is where we live. This is, this is our fallen state. In other words, this is the world of duality. In other words, God's there, and I'm here, and you're over there. This is duality, or separation, which is another word for sin. And, and hence all the problems of the world. How is it overcome? By just coming back. This is the meaning of repentance. Turn back, come back here. 
find that original wholeness is you discover what it is to be one whole, complete and perfect. And then lo and behold, the whole world, the whole world. Instead of being infected with the disease of separation, is healed with the balm of wholeness. Hence healing. This is the work and this is why we're here. And that's what it's all about. And now my agony as a young man, what do I do? What's life for? What am I here for? I dare to venture to suggest that I think I'm on the, on the way to finding the answer. It's the V here. It's real, isn't it? It's actually real, really true. And when we look at each other, what is it that flows between us? Anybody? Not not sure. Oh. Hmm? Love. Love. Of course it is. So much easier when there's no baggage though, when there's no when there's no there's baggage, no. sweetheart, that's the answer. Exactly, sweetie, that's that's mm -hmm. exactly hits the nail on the head when there's no baggage. And the work you see is to let go the baggage. That's right. But actually, it's natural, isn't it? And it's easy, isn't it? It's just, just natural, isn't it? It is a challenge, dear. And um, yes, there are the countless approaches to dealing with it. Um, oh, you know, as a little boy, I, I remember my mother, father saying, don't be selfish. It starts like that, doesn't it? In our childish understanding, unselfishness is how it starts. <laughs> I, one of my great problems as a young man <coughs> having been um, drummed into my head at school that we should love one another. And I, I just didn't love my fellow men. I found it easy, easy to love animals. I loved nature. But I saw people as the problem. And I just couldn't. I felt I couldn't love people. I was full of criticism of, of, the, of society, of civilization. It took me a long time to, I suppose, first of all, accept it, then gradually widen, widen, widen. I don't think I could. I think it was this blessed practice of meditation that gradually, gradually widened my horizons. But I think it's a lot of these things are a lifetime work. You know, people, we all want quick results, don't we? With I don't think we can do it that way. I really I do think now that we're given this, this uh, 80 odd years of life on this earth. It's life, life's like a school and it takes us this long. And God knows I haven't finished. I, I, if I've, this is like a preparatory school. <laughs> 
you graduate to the next school and <laughs> beyond the grave, I think. I don't know where, where we end this learning. But, uh, but I assure you, you never stop learning until your dying day, and I don't think we stop then. Gradually, gradually, we are made less of this separate, corrupt individual and become more universal in our understanding. So we must be patient with ourselves and see if we get, if we start getting critical of the ego, you're just adding <laughs> fuel to the fire, aren't you? You see, the, it's the justice. This is, what, this is what I find much easier now in old age. I, I can see that there is this divine justice in everything and that one is, one is given this ego to illustrate, to show us what we've done, to show us the sin of leaving the original wholeness, you see. We've left paradise. We've fallen. We've fallen in consciousness from our true divine state into this corruption of, of, of death, of mortality. And it, it takes us a lifetime to drum into our thick heads that this is what we've done and it's my fault. And the only one to blame for things in the world is me. There's nothing better in life than to be humbled, humbled and broken, and recognize that you're a failure, that I'm a failure, and I don't know anything. I can love a huge amount, I've got a huge big heart, but what is my heart? compared to the, the great love, the love of God, do you see? Well, I wish it was, but I'm, I'm always a bit frightened of that word, my love. I see. You know, I've poured out, how, how many times I've said, I love you. a bit nervous of that now. There's something bigger than that. I used to think I was one of life's great lovers, dear. And now I think I'm just a failure. I think you're just love. Well, here you see what you see. God bless you. <laughs> I think. Let's come back to the oneness, you see. That which is present. See what happens when the cloud passes over the sun. See the, int the clarity of the light immediately gets darker, doesn't it? It does look nice. See, it's brightened up again, hasn't it? See the cloud, the little, the little cloud has passed. There you are, you see. What a perfect lesson. Feel I've, I've spoken enough now, but if I may, I'll just um, <coughs> th 
throw in one last uh, little illustration to you. <coughs> Some of you may know that I was a farmer and I learnt uh, so much, very much from my farm. Almost everybody that's lucky enough to have even a window box or a flower in a pot um, and knows that uh, things happen. <laughs> You know, man proposes, God disposes. We sow seeds in hope. <laughs> they don't always grow. And even if they do grow, things happen to them. Talk about children. These were my children. And um, it does, things don't, the harvest doesn't always happen as you imagine or hope it will. And the more I uh, pondered on these things as a young man, and and watched the grass and watched the sheep and the animals. I realised that far from knowing what I was doing, I knew less and less. I learnt to trust nature more and myself less. I still think this process of trust. As a little boy, I remember <coughs> Dad saying, Mother knows best. Then I learnt that nature knows best. I think now I feel more confident to say that God knows best of all. And at each stage, I know less. And I take great comfort in that. In the Bible it says, the wisdom of man is foolishness to God. I begin to see it myself now. 